Welcome to the first edition of Securities Lending Saturday live with me, Roy Zimmer Hansel, uh, practice lead at Pierpoint. Uh, happy Saturday. Uh, today, we're going to go back right to the fundamentals of the fundamentals and ask the question, why lend? So if securities lending is something that interests you, whether you're part of the ecosystem, a user or a wannabe user, or you're just plain interested in learning more, then this is the place for you. So let's get to it now. This, uh, this is the first broadcast of 2022. Uh, I don't know what in the world you could have been doing over the last two weeks. I mean, what else is there to do on Christmas Day or New Year's Day? Uh, I'm, I'm sure there was a huge gap in your schedule with me not doing the broadcasts. So um, uh, I'm back. No, never fear. You've uh, you've now got something to do on a Saturday. <clears throat> Listen, thanks very much for being with me. Sorry I'm late. Uh, you know, if I get two weeks off, I need to be retrained. I've had more time off uh, over the last two weeks than I've had in the last two years cumulatively. So uh, so I've completely forgotten how to work all of the dials and the knobs and the buttons, and it's taken me an extra 11 minutes to get started today. So apologies for that. Uh, I want to say hello to David. David, thanks for joining. I'm not certain if this is your first time watching, but, uh, but if so, thanks very much. Uh, Clive, good to see you. And Fanny, always... Uh, listen, Fanny, I always appreciate all of your uh, feedback and input and uh, and attention and interest. Uh, but look, uh, great, great to have you all here. Uh, today, we're going to ask the basic fundamental question of uh, why lend? Uh, look, hopefully all of that holiday stuff, you've had, uh, you know, good times, good friends, good food, uh, good opportunity to spend time with loved ones, and you're back at it with a passion. I know I've got more energy than I've had in a long time, so I'm really pumped up about this and the chance to talk to you. So let's get started. I always have, as you know, a slide deck. And so I've got one today. Today's no different. So we're going to ask why lend. So let's get started here. This is what we've been talking about. <clears throat> this is week 31. The previous 30 weeks, it's all laid out there. And I'm going to be referring to a few of those rather than going over them again. Um, and next week, I'm going to be talking about why most investors don't lend. So today, we're going to say, why should you lend? But obviously, the majority of investors aren't lending today. So we're going to explore some of the reasons why. <clears throat> David, thanks for confirming uh, that this is your first time live. Uh, just a point to everyone that's actually watching this. If you're interested in uh, getting a copy of the slides. I know it says download the slides. You don't actually download the slides at that spot. You register, and what will happen is we'll send you all of the slide decks that we've used for the previous sessions, uh, including today. So that'll be coming out in the, the first few days of next week. <clears throat> so uh, if you want to do that, go to that spot, sign up, and we'll forward them on to you then. Okay. So let me just get back to this. So we'll talk next week about why most investors don't lend. And this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about why should anyone lend? Well, there's obviously four different aspects to it that I'm going to explore today. One is make money. The other is to get free execution. The third part is just market efficiency. And uh, some people feel an obligation to that. Um, and of course, ESG. And I feel very strongly about that. So I'll come back to that. First, let me uh, just clear that off. Uh, one second here. I just want to move this out of the way because, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to do. There we go. Uh, as the line says here, I am not an investment professional. I've been around a long time. I have umpteen different exams and qualifications that I've taken over the years. But this is just for information and entertainment purposes only. You always have to seek professional advice before taking any action in securities lending, short selling, or anything in the markets overall. So hopefully this is a little bit of uh, information, a little bit of enjoyment. Uh, hopefully you can laugh at all of my foibles uh, 
and there we go. I literally, I literally have forgotten how to use all of the controls here. So it's uh, it's all an interesting ride for me as well. <clears throat> of course, the whole objective of all of this is to share what I've had the privilege to learn uh, and uh, discover on my own over the past uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years that I've been doing this. Uh, I want to share it because security lending is actually uh, going all around the world, right? I think, you know, this year we'll see one, maybe two other countries add securities lending to uh, to their package. So it'll become a, a feature in at least one or two other markets. Uh, it's growing year after year after year. So it's really becoming pervasive. And so my objective is to help bring knowledge and understanding of securities lending to the entire world. And you are helping me do that. So thanks very much. One of the ways you can help me is if you uh, like this video, if you find these are helpful, uh, please give us a thumbs up if you want to be made aware of them uh, as we produce new ones each week. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, the other thing, of course, that we're still trying to do is get to 500 subscribers, because if I get to 500 subscribers, I can then open up the community cha channel on YouTube, and that will actually help facilitate questions and answers, and I'll be able to uh, share uh, anything I know about the business and people will be able to ask questions and share their own information with that wider community. Um, uh, Dowdy, I, I hope that's um, how you pronounce your name. Apologies if, if it isn't. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Um, so uh, let's get to 500 subscribers. We're at, I think, 397 as we speak today. We added a few over Christmas. Uh, when they had nothing better to do. But uh, I really appreciate uh, anyone that takes the time to uh, subscribe. And let's get to 500 and share the knowledge even more. Right. So the question that I've been getting asked really since I first started talking to people um, about securities lending really is as far back as as the 1980s. Uh, it, you know, they say, why should I, why should I even participate in securities lending? Because to be honest, it's a marginal amount of return, right? It really is just a, a, a just pennies, literally, on the portfolio. And while I'm only going to be getting pennies, I really have a risk of loss. So why should I even bother doing that? So the question is, you know, is it really just marginal returns uh, against the loss? Or does it really generate good returns for an acceptable level of risk? And of course, I'll say that the truth is, you know, that's an individual decision by institution or by individual retail investors that give that get the opportunity. But you really need to have the proper perspective here. And that's part of what we're trying to do. Um, uh, David, really appreciate you subscribing. That's one person closer uh, to getting to that 500 community. Uh, and uh, I would I would love to be a DJ, but but I can't imagine anyone wanting to listen to my dribble, right? So uh, the bottom line, of course, on all of this stuff is to make money. Uh, here's some charts. Uh, if you look at the 2021 figure, uh, this is this data is courtesy of Data Lend. Uh, the figure for 2021 was 9.28 billion dollars in fees generated for investors and the service providers that bring them uh, to the market, right? And what I've got in the chart in the bottom left is the years from 2008 to uh, 2019. The data source for that is IHS market. Um, and you can see that green line that I've inserted there. That's the $10 billion figure. And uh, someone in the audience, unfortunately, LinkedIn doesn't always show me who's who's saying this stuff, so I can't always see it. But someone's made the great point that in a very low yield environment, when alpha is so hard to find, this does help. In fact, I'm even going to show that because it is such an important point. Uh, so that's exactly the point. When you think about these numbers, there's a couple of things. First of all, you're talking about over this uh, sort of from 2008 to 2021, those 14 years, you're talking about around $140 billion in fees that have been generated over that period of time. And if you think of the way that funds grow over time, it's really about that continuous incremental improvement year after year. 
And the thing that's different about securities lending as opposed to generic investing is that, of course, a market can go up 20%, 30%, 40% in a year. It can also go down 20, 30, or 40% in a year. And a market that goes up 50% one year goes down 50% the next year and goes up 50% the following year is way behind where they actually started out. So what we're talking about here is securities lending, unless you've experienced a loss, it is incremental positive income, whether markets are rising, falling, or moving sideways. So it's always a positive figure, unless you've had a loss. So uh, I'll come to risk in a few minutes here. Uh, but you are what what you have is a different kind of scenario. This is extra money each and every year, and it builds and accumulates over time. And that's really the key point to take away. Now, different institutional investors use that income in different ways. So, for example, ETFs, who are big market participants in this business, uh, they use the earnings in one of two different ways. Some funds use them to add to their market performance. So the fees they generate is incremental in the performance. Other ETFs take those fees, uh, take those revenues and offset them against the expense ratio of running the funds. So either way, investors are actually benefiting from the incremental return. And ETFs, of course, are, are, are purchased mostly by uh, retail investors in some markets, although there is a pretty strong institutional uh, engagement in some markets and some ETFs in particular. Now, of course, mutual funds uh, also are you know, very similar to ETFs, uh, but clearly mutual funds uh, use this uh, securities lending revenue to, to add to their market performance, right? Most mutual funds compete based on their performance. And so these kinds of returns make a big difference uh, to those. And I've actually seen examples and I've, I've published examples in the past where the securities lending revenue will take one fund from, uh, a, a, let's say, a second quartile and move them up into first quartile or third quartile into second quartile. So it really can make a substantial difference to their market position. And of course, the better the performance, the more likely they are to attract investors into their funds. And the final point there, some institutions will offset the administrative operating costs for running an institutional portfolio uh, with the securities lending revenue. So I, I've seen it, many institutions look at it and say, well, custody and administration cost me X, securities lending fees can offset that, all of it, some of it, uh, or sometimes even exceed it, depending on the portfolio construction and the parameters that investors put in. So in many, many different ways, different institutions apply securities lending to the benefit of their own investors and their own customers. So clearly, that's how it works for the institutional side. If we then go to uh, the retail side of things, uh, as, well, okay, so have I missed the slide? I told you, man, I got to be retrained. Um, look, they, I guess the flip side, and this applies to retail investors as well. So this slide's actually a little bit out of order. Um, the reality is the whole question is the pennies in front of a steamroller. Am I picking up little bits of money, but occasionally I get steamrolled with risk of loss? Now, I'm not really going to go into risk too much. These are two other videos from uh, the fundamental series. It's part seven and part eight. Uh, you can find all of this, uh, all of the recordings on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel, which I'll just, uh, I'll just post up now. Hold on. Let me, first of all, get rid of me out of that picture. And then I'm going to put up the YouTube channel. So there is the YouTube channel. If you want to see any of the old videos that I've referred to, uh, these two, or the I'm going to refer to a couple in a, a few minutes, uh, I'll be talking about risks. So uh, there are really six different risks. I go through each of those risks across those two videos. And I also talk about scenarios where you are likely to lose money. And the key thing to remember in securities lending is that in order for an investor that's lending their securities to lose money, a waterfall of activities has to happen. A counterparty goes out of business, Lehman Brothers. 
But if you're lending to 10, 15, 20 different borrowers and one of them goes out of business, of course, that's a risk and there's a potential for loss. But even out of your whole portfolio, it's still only one entity. Secondly, you've got the collateral backing that, right? And then thirdly, many of the service providers that uh, you know, provide lending uh, agency uh, capabilities to their clients, what they will do is they'll also provide indemnifications. And so you also have a layer that says, not only does the counterparty have to go out of business, the collateral has to be insufficient, and then you still have a further layer of protection of the indemnification. So uh, the indemnification makes up for any gaps. And then the only way you can lose is either your service provider doesn't follow through with that indemnification or they go into default themselves. And I'm not aware of that situation ever having caused losses. So there's a lot that has to go uh, wrong before you start losing one cent. Remember, if you have a loan of 100 and you have a collateral of 105 and that collateral loses 5% of its value, you're still flat. You still haven't lost anything if your counterparty has gone out of business. So it's only when it falls below that level and your indemnification doesn't uh, survive that you have a problem. Okay, so get the get the risk in context. So in exchange for that marginal risk, what you have is $130 billion of fees that you have an opportunity to get a piece of. So that's the revenue versus risk. As I said, take a look at those videos to talk about risk, uh, learn more about the risk. From a retail investor point of view, what I've done is I've posted up a number of uh, the different firms that, uh, that have securities lending um, uh, uh, or, or short selling uh, allowed for their investors. And the revenue that they make from the lending, it either goes directly to the customer, so they, they get fees for the assets that they've been loaning out, or it subsidizes the broker. The broker keeps the money, and in exchange, they may offer free execution. Now, it's not up to me to determine for you as a retail investor whether that's a good deal or a bad deal. I'm just saying that's the way it is, right? It is a part of the business, and it is a growing part. So it is going to be pervasive across market after market. This is a this is a trend that will just continue to grow. And there's no reason for it not to grow, right? If you understand what the risks are, uh, and that's always the key point, then why shouldn't you benefit? Why should institutional investors have a leg up over retail investors? And these and other firms give you the opportunity to benefit from it. So if you're not with these guys, ask whoever your broker is if they offer the services. If they don't, ask why not. Maybe they have a, a different perspective than I do, and maybe they think it's inappropriate, but it's best that you ask the questions and find out for yourself. Okay. The, the next part is uh, market efficiency, right? So securities lending, uh, you can say, well, look, it's really just about the money that the investor makes. And that's the end of the story. Um, and while I get that, there is also an element that says, if you are a market participant, it is in your best interest to have an efficient marketplace. So let me give you an example of how this actually, the market was impacted by uh, activity that's kind of external to the normal investor community. Of course, over the last sort of 10, 12 years, we've had quite a lot of quantitative easing by central banks where what they've been doing is buying back typically government bonds. Although, you know, in Japan, it even went as far as uh, ETFs uh, and underlying securities. And there's been questions about whether that's also happened in other markets. Um, the truth is European central banks ended up owning a very large chunk of the European government bonds that they had issued. The problem with that is because they became owners of it, the market had less supply available to it. And so in the early days after quantitative easing, what was found is there were operational roadblocks. There were settlement problems uh, and trading problems that actually made the markets worse because the central banks were uh, buying up all of the bonds. They weren't in the marketplace. So central banks, uh, quite rightly, uh, were very hesitant about getting into the securities lending business 
directly because they saw themselves as competing with institutional investors and they didn't want to distort the market in that way. So they reluctantly started making securities available whenever there was seemed to be an obvious operational roadblock. And uh, that was all fine, uh, except it became more and more common as they were buying more bonds, as they were becoming the bigger and bigger proportionate holders of all European government bonds, these kind of opportunistic uh, searches for problems uh, really became mainstream. It became almost a, a daily occurrence. And so the central banks really were brought into the fold as being continuous, ongoing, just competitive lenders. So uh, the the reality is uh, they became just regular lenders. They, 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 they got over the issue of competing. And of course, it's also made them some money as well as making the market more efficient. If you look at Norgus Bank in, uh, Investment Management, uh, representing the one of the largest, if not the largest global investor, they have publicly said that as a big holder of so many securities, they feel an obligation to make those securities available in the marketplace for securities lending activity to help smooth over operational activity and uh, supporting market market making, right? So you can see that there is a, a, a wider common goal which says, let's just make markets better. And if the securities are available for loan, that will support market making, that'll support short sellers, bringing a different view in the market. Of course, short sellers, one of the things they do bring to a market is when they have a short sale, you know that there is a future purchase down the road. And of course, lending supports uh, operational uh, market risk reduction. So just, just a few points here. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for There's quite a lot of comments today. Um, look, I, th I think this is quite a good comment to put up here as well. Uh, any good lender should have a margining system that allows them to control the risk of the market valuation moves. Uh, is this correct? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it depends the extent to which someone's doing it themselves or whether they're outsourcing it to a service provider. But uh, in, in either case, there has to be a robust uh, check there somewhere. That is the essence of it. So the, to me, there's two layers of risk reduction. Number one, only deal with counterparties that you have confidence in, right? There is no need to go to entities that you don't uh, feel are credit worthy because there'll always be someone else that wants to borrow security. So number one, uh, you want to pick the right counterparties because uh, if you were uh, dealing with counterparties that are still in business today and you were taking paper clips as collateral, you would still be okay. Whereas if you were dealing with Lehman Brothers and you were taking gold bars delivered to your house, you'd still be out of luck potentially, right? So pick the right counterparty, pick the right collateral. And if you are depending on the collateral, then you need to actually be able to manage and monitor all of the market risk activity. So Clive, absolutely right. Stuart, hello, man. Good, uh, good, um, good seeing you. Have I got music playing? Uh, have I got music playing? I don't think I have music playing. Uh, I've thought about doing music, but uh, that was more to distract people from me rambling on. Uh, so I've talked about liquidity. Um, if Listen, if anyone can hear music, I'd type it into the chat. I'd love to hear that. Um, price discovery, of course, is for short selling. Uh, short selling actually helps uh, with price discovery because it provides the opportunity for someone to bring a different view to the market. Otherwise, markets are skewed to only people that think stocks are going up uh, or people that have been previous buyers of it selling it, but it is it is sort of upward leaning and there's no, no view. The other thing, of course, uh, is that it gives the opportunity for mismatches in prices. So like an index to its underlying constituents, arbitrage trading to bring those prices uh, securities into alignment. Same happens with ETFs. Options are obviously part of that as well. So, so price discovery. You know, this is another another tool that, or another output from the availability of securities available for loan. Uh, the fact that most regulators require securities lending or short selling to have previously confirmed that they can borrow shares prior to engaging in the short sale. What that does is it puts a constraint on the amount of short selling that can be done because it can only be satisfied by the shares that are actually available in the market or the bonds that are available in the market. So uh, 
securities lending as kind of a regulator uh, or modulator over short selling activity is really important. And of course, the bit that that I always have trouble uh, uh, convincing people of is this kind of peak and trough uh, um, uh, moderation, where as markets rise too high, short sellers are going in there to offset that by by short selling more activity the higher the market goes, uh, and that kind of dampens the steepness of the rise, which is good. So markets have more time to digest whether the rise is really justifiable. Um, and then, of course, on the other direction, once markets are actually crashing, of course, the only ones buying when markets are crashing are short sellers covering their positions to book their profits while everyone else continues to sell, right? So short sellers are also the ones that mean the bottom isn't quite as low. So that kind of regulating activity, I think, is really beneficial. And of course, none of these things can happen without investors making their securities available for loans. So that's why I think it's critical for market efficiency. Now, look, I'm again, here's two other videos that I'm going to refer to. Uh, I did two videos on uh, ESG and securities lending uh, 21 and 22 in the series. You'll see them. I think they're cleverly entitled ESG part one and ESG part two. Uh, but look, my view is that ESG as an emerging uh, really investment uh, philosophy needs people to play uh, policemen. And there's a couple of different levels that that happens at. Number one, companies that say that they are doing sustainable uh, or that they have sustainable plans in place and they're following through with their agenda, someone has to check that they're really doing that or and not just saying that they're doing it, right? Because a company can make an announcement at a board meeting, get lots of press, get maybe their stock price rises, someone has to follow on and say, are you really doing that? And of course, that's the short sellers. Secondly, uh, there are the investment managers who are creating ESG products to, for the benefit of investors that want ESG oriented products. And again, who is the one that's actually checking whether those products really are meeting the criteria of the investors? Right. So at that end, at the company level and the investment manager with investment products levels, I think that's important. At an individual investor level, of course, you've got securities lending policies, which include things like voting and counterparty choice, which securities they'll be uh, uh, willing and able to lend uh, and the collateral that they take. And again, one of the key trends that I think will really start to play out this year much more heavily than last year is that the collateral that people will accept will become increasingly aligned with their front end ESG and responsible investing um, philosophies and uh, um, uh, criteria, right? Because it doesn't make sense to me why someone wouldn't be able to buy a stock outright because of their ESG philosophy, but they could take it as collateral. That seems to me as inconsistent, particularly because you own the collateral once you've got it. Okay. So again, watch those two videos if you want to learn more about ESG and uh, securities lending. And then uh, I'll give you the big pitch. So this is the training stuff. I have to tell you over the last couple of months, the interest in training has just skyrocketed. So uh, I have a lot more happening. And the interesting thing is uh, a lot more of it. People want to get back to live training. I love doing the live training. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm back at it starting later this month. Uh, and I'm, I'm so excited. So excited. Uh, but of course, we've got the online course. I'm really excited when you do that as well, uh, because I want people to learn more about the business. Right. So let's just do a summary. Um, why lend? Uh, number one, you're, you're lending to make money. So that might be to reduce operating expenses, improving performance, or getting free execution, as I said. Uh, and the free execution really is part of the uh, growth of retail investing or the democratization of investing, you know, the whole idea about doing uh, um, uh, fractional shares uh, and then getting involved with the securities lending activity and short selling and a much bigger part of uh, the retail community than ever before. 
market efficiency, as I said, without lenders uh, making their securities available, uh, you would not have as efficient markets as they are today. So a good investor, in my view, if the asset, if the business is appropriate from a risk reward profile, the, a good investor makes their securities available for loan. And fundamentally, I think ESG is dependent on investors making portfolios available for loan to support companies that have good agendas and to challenge and uh, motivate companies that have poor sustainability agendas uh, into changing their plans and views. All right. So as I said, that's it for this week. Um, we talked today about why lend. Uh, in this case, we're going to be talking next week about all these stop signs, why most investors don't lend because the majority of investors still don't lend today. Uh, if this video has been, uh, been helpful to you, then please give me a thumbs up and a like. And if you haven't subscribed yet, uh, uh, as uh, I, in fact, I got a note here from David who said he has subscribed. So as I said uh, earlier in the broadcast, we're one person closer. If you think this will help people that you actually know, uh, please share with them. Uh, that's it for me. Happy New Year to you. Uh, I, I'm the kind of guy who keeps saying Happy New Year to the end of January and people tell me to shut up, but I don't care. This is going to be a happy new year. All the best to you. Happy Saturday. Have a great weekend. Have a great week. See you next Saturday. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.